webinar. So welcome this evening to the Living with Wildlife seminar that's being hosted by the city of Duarte. We're lucky to have a great panelist, uh, panel of speakers, three coming from the California Department of Fish and Wildlife. Uh, my name is Victoria Rocha. I am the assistant to the city manager and the public information officer. I'm gonna do a brief introduction of all of our speakers before turning it over to them. They may give a, even more insight onto who they are. And then uh, both our groups, um, the California Department of Wildlife and Doherty Public Safety have presentations. We are going to take questions in between each presentation. Um, so just remember, I don't know if anyone saw it in the, the reminder email that went out, or if you just signed up, maybe you didn't receive this email, we won't be using the raise your hand function at all. We won't be unmuting people or things like that. We're just going to use the Q&A function. So if you have questions, Go ahead and write them in the box, even as the presenters are speaking, and I will start to collect those. And I, as your moderator, when we pause for questions in between the presentations, we'll take about 10 minutes worth of questions after the first presentation, read them out loud, let our panelists answer, and then move into the second presentation with the rest of the time. And we gave ample time being here till 8 p.m. for lots of questions. So really the success of this event is driven by the attendees today. So I'm going to introduce first Mackenzie Rich. She is a human wildlife conflict specialist. And then we also have Jessica West, who is a human wildlife conflict specialist. As I understand it, they work on different regions, um, although closely they work together. And then we have Rebecca Barboza, who is a wildlife biologist, again, with the California Department of Fish and Wildlife. Then we have Larry Brasita. He is our public safety manager. So he's really gonna be able to answer your very hyper local questions if you have some scenarios for our Duarte residents. Although, as I understand it, we may have residents from all over the Foothill region and this will be an event that can um, benefit everybody because the wildlife moves around as we all know. So I'm gonna turn it over now to Mackenzie and we will get started. Oh goodness. Hi friends. Thank you guys all so much for being here. Thank you, Victoria, for that lovely introduction. Um, I am going to go ahead and get ready to share my PowerPoint, but again, just really appreciate everybody being here. I hope you guys enjoy this as much as I do. So let me just pop on here and share my screen and we will get this ball rolling. All right. So as Victoria said, my name is Mackenzie Rich and I am a human wildlife conflict specialist with the California Department of Fish and Wildlife. And that is just a big fancy title for wildlife biologist who deals with human wildlife conflict. A um, little bit about my background. I was with the state before as a bobcat biologist. I actually had my master's degree in carnivore ecology and movement biology. And then I transferred over to this position as a human wildlife conflict specialist. So really excited to be here with y'all. All right, so a little bit about the CDFW. Our goal is really to manage California's diverse fish, wildlife, plant resources, the habitats on which they depend, for their, both their intrinsic and ecological values and also for their enjoyment as use as us as the public. You might know us as the California Department of Fish and Game. And actually in 2013, we changed our names, Department of Fish and Wildlife to kind of better represent what we were doing and our goals as an agency. We're a regulatory or steward agency for wildlife, which just, again, is a fancy way of saying we implement policy established by the California Department of our Fish and Game Commission, pardon me. And our goal is really to protect and, and help maintain healthy wildlife populations, but also overseeing those recreational areas that we use um, for fun, our scientific or educational research purposes as well. And where I come in, we are the lead agency charged with human wildlife conflict response. So as we're getting into this and as we're getting started, I just really want to acknowledge that human wildlife conflict is really complex, contextual, it's complicated. It really is based on our attitudes, our values, perceptions, our tolerance of wildlife, our backgrounds, what community knowledge or identities we hold, what traditions are interconnected with that in our um, relationship with natural resources. And so just acknowledging that there are a lot of different opinions and they're all okay. Everyone is entitled to their own opinion and that's a-okay and it's all good in the hood. Um, so before we really talk about wildlife conflict, we really need to understand um, what it is we think of when we're thinking of wildlife habitat. <laughs> kind of when we're thinking of this, right? We're thinking of rolling hills and beautiful mountains and open skies and prairies and forests. 
but what about this? What about this neighborhood in the valley? Is this really wildlife habitat? Can it actually sustain a wildlife population and a healthy population at that? So we're going to talk a little bit about that. So habitat in general, just as a general reference, is the place or environment where a plant or animal naturally and normally lives and grows. And to have that, there are kind of four main things that we really need. One is food, two is water, three is shelter, and then four is conspecifics, really other individuals of the same species. So talking about food, what kind of food is available in an urban habitat? There's actually a lot. So the first one we're gonna talk about real quick is feral cats. Feral cats are actually a really strong food source, especially for coyotes, for some of our predatory species. We can talk about food resource being our lawns, right? We have gardens, we have lush lawns when there's rain, we have flowers, we have fruit trees, avocado trees, you know, all of these things actually present a food resource for our wildlife and they, they can and do access that. Another food resource, <laughs> we don't think of it as food ourselves, but as our trash, right? We all know in the foothill communities, bears love trash, but so do coyotes and raccoons and many other species. Another food resource for them in the urban habitat is when we feed our pets outside, we leave, you know, food out for feral cats because we want to, you know, we want to help them or we leave food out for our dog just so they can kind of graze as they go throughout the day. But wildlife will also access that food and it, it's a good source of nutrition for them as well. Water is also especially important, especially during a drought like we're in right now. So water can come from all sorts of places, like what we're thinking of our pools, our fountains, our koi ponds, different, you know, runoff, stream runoffs, or different um, potholes that collect, anything that kind of collects water, which is pretty common in an urban habitat, is a great source of water for these animals. And they don't care that it's dirty. Shelter is another big one. So under our homes, under our decks, or under our crawl spaces, Bears really like to access that, but so do a lot of other wildlife. It's cool, it's sheltered, it's protecting them from the elements, it's generally quiet. So it's really nice for them, they really like it. Our attics, unfortunately, wildlife also like our attics and our insulation up there. We can talk about shelter in highway underpasses or culverts, like we see this bobcat kind of hanging around, or it can be like just under a tree or a bush that we don't really notice, but they've dug a den under there. And there's a lot of places that animals can kind of sneak in and get in in our urban habitat. Conspecifics are under individuals, right? If there are food, water, and shelter available for one animal, there's gonna be food, water, and shelter available for more. And so animals actually rely on each other. They either um, survive in packs or groups, or they need others there to re um, reproduce and mate. So you need other individuals of the same species around, and that's definitely provided. So is this valley neighborhood a wildlife habitat? Well, it's got food, it's got water, definitely got shelter, and for sure as heck has con specifics. So it's definitely wildlife habitat, absolutely. There is this thing that we think of then coming from that with wildlife habitat, you know, and especially when we're talking about foothill communities, we, we tend to think of bear country and then human country, right? So where wildlife is and should be, or bears are and should be, and then areas where people are and should be. But wildlife don't understand property boundaries. My life would be a whole heck of a lot easier if they did, but they don't, unfortunately. And so because of this, they don't really understand that, like, you know, we think of them as needing to be out in the wild. They're like, well, I've got my food, water, shelter, and other friends here, so I'm going to hang out here. And if we don't manage those attractants, those things that are drawing them in, that food, water, shelter, then that's when human country can very easily become wildlife country. So what kind of wildlife do here? We've established, we know what habitat is. We know that this urban landscape can be habitat for wildlife. What kind of wildlife are gonna take advantage of that? First one we're gonna talk about is the coyote. Coyotes are actually omnivores, which is something that we don't really think of, right? We look at them, we think dog, we think meat eater. And yes, they will take rabbits and squirrels and rodents, but they'll also go for fruit and nuts and seeds, some roots sometimes. So they're actually able to access, they're a real big generalist. And just what that means is they will eat anything and everything. They are good at that. Adults typically weigh anywhere from 18 to 25 pounds, maybe a little bigger, maybe a little smaller, but they're not as big as we think they are. I mean, think about it, that's like a beagle size, right? You know, we think of them as these big burly animals, but they're really not. They're actually really kind of sleek and small. Home ranges, anywhere from 
one to 15 square miles, really depending on how many resources are available, right? Especially for coyotes who are a territorial species, they're not going to want to have to defend 15 square miles if they have everything we need in one square mile, right? You got to think, think like a coyote, right? <laughs> think, think a little more economically. The biggest source of conflict that we see as a department with coyotes is interactions with cats and dogs. So unfortunately, coyotes will take those, those animals at times and then concerns for public safety. So those are like the two big ones that we really um, get brought to us. Bobcats are our next species. Now, bobcats are near and dear to my heart. I'm an Ohio University graduate. We were the bobcats. I then studied bobcats for a couple of years. So I, I'm a bobcat queen. I love my bobcats, right? Bobcats, unlike coyotes, they are strict carnivores. So they're only eating rodents, rabbits, squirrels, birds occasionally, if they can get to them, turkeys even. <laughs> so if they can get to it, they'll eat it, meat eaters. They're similar in size to coyotes, actually, anywhere from 15 to 20 pounds. A big husky male can maybe get up to 25, maybe 30, but typically what we're seeing, especially in these urban landscapes, are the, the, the 15 to 20 pounders. Home ranges are a little bit smaller than coyotes, typically one to three square miles. They're able to do pretty well within that size of home range. And the most common source of conflict for these guys is interactions with chickens and livestock, so like ducks, small goats maybe. Unfortunately, they will go in and, and take that and do see that and access that food resource. Black bears, I'm sure you guys are well aware and very familiar with these guys. They are omnivores. They primarily go for like fruits, plants, nuts, seeds, acorns, um, insects, um, any kind of other animal protein. So they'll occasionally take koi from koi ponds. They might scavenge off a kill. They'll take fawns in the spring but really just like garbage compactors, right? They'll eat everything. <laughs> um, adults, so males typically 150 to 350 pounds. Typically what we're seeing when we're out in the field and, and responding is about 250 pounds for a male. Females a little smaller, 100, 200 pounds. And again, typically what we're seeing is kind of smack in the middle there around 150, give or take. Home well, range for these guys. So we've got two numbers here, you'll see. So when they're out in the quote wild or open space, the open forests and things, typically the home range is about 60 to 150 square miles. They really need that big area because they need a lot of protein. They need a lot of food. They need a lot of resources. So especially during their hyperphagia phase, which they are kind of clicking into now when they're fattening up for winter, they're eating about 20,000 calories a day uh, to kind of maintain that fat level and store up some more fat as well. And so when they're out in the wilderness, they really need that, that big home range to access it when they're in human territory or in urban landscapes, really only need three to 11 square miles. I mean, and we'll see individuals that know the trash days. And so they'll be in one community on one day because it's trash day that day. And then they'll kind of work their way up and go to the trash day and then kind of work their way back around. So they're very good at accessing the food resources. And that's the primary conflict we see with these guys, seeking food in human areas and then concerns for public safety as well. I mean, these are definitely large animals. So it's totally understandable why that would be disconcerting. So 100% understand that. Mountain lions. So mountain lions are carnivores. They're strict carnivores as well. Primarily going for mule deer. They're wanting to take those big animals that they can store for about seven to 10 days. They'll do what we call as caching. And after they feed on it initially, they'll bury it and kind of save it for later. So they're very good at eating their leftovers, unlike us, right? We all store them in the fridge and never remember them, but these guys do. They'll also take coyotes, raccoons, rabbits, anything small that they can get their hands on, but primarily they're going after mule deer. Adults typically weigh anywhere males 110 to 180 pounds, females 80 to 130. Once again, what we typically see is somewhere in the middle of that. We don't really see a whole ton of males, um, especially ones that make their way into urban landscapes. Um, get to be that big, but it can happen. And these guys, similar to bobcats too, um, they, they mostly avoid the, the super urban areas. They're usually found on the interface of kind of rural and suburban um, landscapes where you might have, you know, small properties or small farms. That's generally the area we see conflict arise with mountain lions, but it's not unheard of for them to make their way into a city, but they're usually not going to stay and hang around. They're going to think, nah, not really here, but not about it. Don't really want to. You see Santa Cruz actually did a study where they compared um, mountain lion responses to like natural calls, like crickets and, and frog calls and that sort of thing to like human voices. And they've kind of proved mountain lions are more scared of us than we are of them, which I know sounds counterintuitive and I know sounds a little goofy and like a biologist's byline, but they really are. They really don't have any interest in interacting with us at all. 
So home ranges for these guys are typically anywhere from 60 to 200 square miles. Again, just depending on how dense is the mule deer population, how much water do they have access to? Do they have an area for a den if it's a female with kittens? Things like that. Primary conflict for these guys is interaction with livestock. Again, because they're on that kind of urban um, rural interface, where those, those livestock are, um, they'll tend to go for goats, unfortunately, or chickens. We had lions get caught in chicken coops before, um, so there's that. And there's also concerns for public safety. And again, it's understandable. These are predatory species. They look big and scary. And the thing to understand is, once again, they don't see us as prey. We are not on the menu for any of our predatory species in California. So great news, you're not on the menu. Mule deer, so again, primary prey for mountain lions. So. Mule deer are herbivorous. They're gonna go for grasses, fruits, seeds, nuts, roots, flower buds, that sort of thing. Adult males, anywhere from 120 to 330 pounds, but typically, again, we're seeing like males, especially during rut, um, the season where they're kind of big and bulky, like ready to go for the ladies, um, about 200 pounds. And females, anywhere from 95 to 200, but again, kind of sitting somewhere in the middle, about 120-ish, what we're seeing. Home range for these guys is really small, only one to four square miles. And in urban landscapes, we're talking just one square mile. These guys are very good at accessing the resources and especially in urban landscapes where we have our lawns and our flower gardens and our fruit trees and our gardens. They are very good at accessing those resources and actually just kind of stay in one little area. So you guys, I'm probably sure if you've had deer in your yard, you're like, oh, that's the my Forky buck. His name's Bob. I see him all the time, every Sunday at 2 p.m. on the clock. Yeah, that sort of thing. These guys have very small home ranges. So the primary issue with them, being the herbivores they are, is they'll get in ornamental plants or gardens or agricultural crops. These guys really like vineyards, unfortunately for us. Um, so that's the primary issue we see. And we see issues with these guys all year round. Some backyard wildlife. This is the fun stuff, right? There's our raccoons, our striped skunks, opossums, rabbits. These guys are um, both omnivorous and herbivorous. So you know, fruits, nuts, insects, sometimes animal protein if they're going to scavenge for more of our skunks and our raccoons and our, our possums. And I love possums because I don't love ticks. And those guys can eat up to 5,000 ticks in a night. So we love our possums. Let's keep those guys around, right? Get rid of the ticks. Um, so all these guys have kind of different home ranges. Typically, a few square uh, miles can be as small as a couple acres, really just depending, again, on the accessibility, how dense are those food resources and the shelter and the water. Most common conflict source for these guys is getting into trash, uh, trash, pardon me, or pet food or water, eating your fruit trees and shrubs, primarily where we see this and right trash pandas, right? They're getting into our trash, our raccoons. So now that we're, we talked a little bit about, you know, what's habitat, okay, yes, this urban landscape is habitat for wildlife and what wildlife are we gonna see? Now we can kind of transition into what kind of conflict are we gonna see and how can we prevent that conflict? So this picture is from um, July of 2021. A black bear was um, south of the 101, which is really rare. We don't typically see these animals south of those big highways. Um, he was what we would consider a no harm, no foul bear, just a bear that was in the wrong place at the wrong time. Um, but that does raise the question again, like, okay, what do we do when we see wildlife in our backyard? Number one thing. If you guys don't take anything away from tonight, please, I am begging you take this away. Never feed wildlife. And that's either intentionally like, oh, well, it's the drought. You know, I want to I, I want to help them and totally understand. want to help them and give them, you know, watermelon or water or carrots for the deer. Um, but that causes problems we'll discuss in a hot minute. But never feed them intentionally or unintentionally. You know, we can have <laughs> trash cans that are unsecure and we can feed them. We can leave food out for our pets and they can access that food. Bird feeders, we love our birds. My mom is a big bird watcher, but bird feeders actually are huge draws in for bears. And so even things that we don't even think of, right? You're like, I'm gonna feed a bird, not a bear, can actually draw wildlife in. It's also against the law to feed wildlife. So of the Fish and Game Code, uh, section 251.3, it's actually a prohibition against feeding big game mammals. Um, and it just says that no person shall knowingly feed big game mammals as defined in section 350 of these regulations. So it, it's a problem for a lot of reasons. And what it actually does is it causes habituation. Habituation is just when animals show really no reaction to humans anymore, just because they have been repeatedly exposed to human stimulus, right? And there's been really kind of no negative consequence. 
So they know that if I come around, I can get in a trash can and I see people, but nothing really happens. Nobody really yells at me. There's really nothing negative or like they yell at me, but like, whatever, I'm just going to eat my trash anyway. And so that's when we really start to see problems caused. So wildlife that is habituated can cause property damage. So now they're accessing trash cans or they're tearing down, you know, structures that are built to keep trash cans safe. Or maybe they're going into your garage and opening your garage refrigerator and, you know, getting all your cool whip out of it. Maybe they're breaking into your chicken coop and that can actually cause, you know, death to your livestock. Or maybe they got into your goat pen and got one of your baby goats. Maybe this animal is now being deemed a public safety threat by law enforcement because they're approaching people, not scaring off and kind of like pawing at people because they've learned like, oh, I've been fed by people before. Hand means food. Therefore, tap the hand, give me the food. And so, you know, even if this, maybe this animal wasn't hand fed, maybe it was taught by its mother that was, you know, humans mean food. And so we create this condition where we're just having generation after generation after generation of habituated animals. And that's not good for us. And it's really not good for them either, because oftentimes this can lead to the animal needing to be euthanized, whether that's through the state's depredation policy or through law enforcement deeming the animal to be a public safety threat. And so ultimately, although we, we think feeding them is helping them and you know it's a drought, we wanna help, but it's actually causing way more problems than it is helping. And it ultimately creates a system that is, that is setting this bear up to fail or any wildlife species up to fail, unfortunately. So how do we manage these attractants so that we don't get habituated animals, right? Number one thing we really talk about is trash cans. The big thing here is to try to purchase wildlife resistant garbage cans. You can retrofit existing trash cans. You can rent trash cans from um, different trash agencies and companies will allow you to rent them instead of purchasing them outright. So there are a lot of ways and you don't, again, you don't have to purchase a new one or rent one. You can just kind of retrofit the one you have. Um, another big thing is only putting your trash cans out the morning of trash pickup. I know it's a lot more convenient to put it out at night but unfortunately, animals will come in that very short time and access that trash can. So another thing we recommend is to keep your garbage inside a garage is really the best place or inside some sort of secure building or secure structure that the animal can't get access to. Um, for bears as well, but also for coyotes, for raccoons, a lot of different wildlife species will access that trash. And so one of the best ways is just to kind of keep it inside. Another thing that we recommend is to frequently disinfect your garbage cans. So, you know, washing it out with a little bit of Dawn every time or, you know, dish soap or what have you, even just water rinsing it out after every time trash is picked up, it can really help reduce that scent because, you know, we don't want the scent to be strong. So bear noses especially are actually a hundred times better than ours, which is about seven times better than a bloodhound's. So putting that in perspective, like this bear can smell your trash from like miles, away. like it can smell and it will hone in. Like you had pizza the night before, Bears having pizza for dinner tomorrow morning, right? Another thing, um, moving away from maybe bears and coyotes a little bit more, is planting deer or rabbit resistant plants. So you can do that. You can try, there are commercially available repellents that you can kind of pop on your garden. You can get those at a garden center online, probably at a, like, a, um, uh, ooh, like a hardware store is another one. So there's are out there too. And you can also install herbivory resistant fencing. So essentially, you know, like we see in this little picture here down on the bottom right of the screen, there's just like a little cage that's built with some netting that, that animals can't get access to. And so by preventing the deer from getting into your garden or the rabbits getting into your garden, you're preventing conflict before it happens. And that's really the key is to prevent conflict before it happens and before it escalates. We have to protect our pets too, right? We love our Fidos and our kitty cats. We love them. We got to protect them. The best thing to do is to feed your cats and dogs indoors and to really not allow pets out um, unsupervised. So I know cats love to roam, we love it, but get them a catio or take them out on leash. We've seen a lot of cats while we're out and about that are leash trained. Cats love it, people love it, it's great. But keep um, pets indoors when they can't be closely monitored outdoors, especially your small little guys. And the bigger ones, big large dogs in after dark, keep them in secure kennels at night um, we just want to prevent access um, for them to wildlife. Uh, the other thing is always walk your dog on a leash. I know your dog might have the best recall training, but ultimately in the end, that doesn't super matter. If your animal is farther away from you, and we really recommend a six foot leash, but if that animal is farther away from you, you've got a retractable leash and it's 10 feet ahead of you sniffing, 
you've got your little, let's, you know, you've got your Pomeranian, right? Walking ahead and sniffing some spot that another dog has used and just trying to, you know, check things out, having fun on a walk. A coyote can zip in there, grab it and be gone. Especially with how small those, those retractable leashes are and how like snappy they get. It's really not a good idea to walk your wildlife, or walk your wildlife. Yeah, please don't walk wildlife. <laughs> walk your pets on a leash that's any more than six feet long. Avoid walking your pets between um, dusk and dawn at night. I mean, you know, take them out to potty, what have you, but, but really don't take them on walks at that time. That's when these animals are most active. And yes, wildlife, especially in urban landscapes, can be active at all times of day. That's really the peak hours that we really want to avoid. Um, if you have to, make sure you're bringing a flashlight, some kind of shaker can, which we'll talk in a minute, or deterrent. And we'll get into those, I promise. We'll go. We'll go there. Another thing you can do is trimming back dense vegetation in your yard. Um, to really limit the areas that wildlife can hide, right? I mean, I've seen, I've been on calls before. We've got a mountain lion in an urban landscape that's unfortunately like, no harm, no foul, just in the wrong place at the wrong time we've had to go get. And it was hiding. We had telemetry. We knew it was like right around us, but we could not see it where it was hiding in this vegetation. And so trimming just back that vegetation a little bit around your house, reducing those areas for those animals to hide is a really great way to kind of help protect you and your pets. Uh, you can consider installing uh, fence exclusion devices. Um, these are like the rollers you see on top of that fence there. And basically these are primarily for coyotes, but they could also work for other species. The animal goes up, tries to get on the fence, and it just kind of rolls back down. There's a lot of videos of that on YouTube um, if you want to see how those work in a little bit more detail. Another one we really like is these armored vests. I think they're adorable and they come in all sorts of colors and styles. You can get really long spikes or these short like spike studs that you see here. But basically what it does is a predator comes in to grab the pet, predator gets a mouthful of spikes, peace out Girl Scout, it doesn't want anything to do with that anymore. And so they work great and they're really cute too. Like I just think they're fun. So it's always a great option as well. I don't know that we have a lot in Duarte about um, livestock of our animals, but we're going to go into it anyway, just so you guys have that information. Maybe you move in five years or maybe you do have some livestock that I'm not aware of. So let's go into it a little bit. The biggest thing that we recommend for livestock animals, which in this area is primarily goats or chickens, but is to keep them in a completely enclosed structure, especially at night. I'm talking roof, four walls, wired, buried under the ground so the animal can't dig under it. These wildlife are very, very adept at trying to figure out how to access food resources when it's in front of them because they're thinking, I don't know where my next meal's coming from. I want this now. And so they're really good at accessing those resources. Again, so just try to make sure they're in that fully enclosed structure, securely fasten everything, no gaps bigger than four inches. And the other thing I want to point out too, real quick while we're here is chicken wire is a lot of things. Times people have chicken coops with chicken wire. Chicken wire is great for keeping chickens in. It is terrible at keeping wildlife out. And so that's something that we really kind of want to work with <laughs> and to, to try to avoid using. There's a hog wire or farm wire, I think it's sometimes called. That's a really great, those are peak. They're very sturdy. They can hold a lot of weight, which is something you want because that roof should be strong enough to hold at least 200 pounds for a mountain lion. And honestly, probably 250 to 300 pounds would be ideal because bears sometimes can get up there. And those guys, especially in the winter are little chunks. So we definitely want to make sure that there's not any way for wildlife to get in to access our food, our pets, pardon me, um, as food resources. Livestock guardian dogs are another great resource. Uh, first of all, they're cute and fluffy, so who doesn't love that? But second of all, they really do work at protecting livestock. You also want to discourage wild prey from your property. So for example, you have hay out for your goats, right? Great, awesome sauce. But what else would eat that hay is a mule deer. And what eats a mule deer is a mountain lion. And that mountain lion will also take your unattended livestock or your livestock that's not properly secured, which is really sad and we don't love to see it, but it can and does happen. So making sure you're discouraging that wild prey from the property is also critical, as well as removing preventing, preventing access to water. So making sure that maybe you've got a large rain barrel or maybe you've got a trough that's got water in it for your livestock making sure wildlife can't then access that as well, because then they'll be on property and say, hey, oh, look, that goat's not in a, in a secure structure. Let me just go, go ahead and grab that, which is, again, really sad. I know our livestock can be our pets as well, or a significant investment. So we want to do everything we can to prevent wildlife from accessing our livestock or barnyard animals. With that, people often ask us about fencing. Okay, so can I, you know, put a fence in around my corral or around my pasture it's definitely possible 
but with that, it it's, has to be the right type of fencing, right? So, you know, people are like, oh, I got a six foot fence and it's chain link. That's not unfortunately going to stop wildlife from accessing it in any way. It really needs to be at least six to 10 feet. I would think 12 feet would be better, taller the better, and then have an overhang as well so that they can't jump up and then get in um, because wildlife can jump a lot higher than we think. <laughs> so it's really important to make sure we prevent that access. Protecting people is also important, right? So like I said, we need to cut back that low-lying vegetation. This image, I think, is a really great one that really goes to show you how easily an animal can hide just in our short little shrubs. And so just cutting that up two to three feet off the ground, still aesthetically pleasing, right? We don't want to just hack things, but, you know, just cutting it up a little bit can actually really prevent those hiding spaces and just make our areas more secure for ourselves. We want to encourage children in areas, especially in the foothills or areas where, you know, wildlife is, to encourage children to play um, outdoors in groups and really during the daytime only with adult supervision. It's just, you know, children are smaller and unfortunately sometimes the wildlife, you know, don't see them as a threat so much. The other thing is, is kids, I, if I was a kid having lived in here, I'd see a bear and be like, hug, cute teddy bear right? It, kids don't necessarily understand. <laughs> These are not things we want to approach. They are cute, but they are not cuddly. So we want to make sure we've got adult supervision for them as well. Making sure we hike, bike, walk in groups outdoors. You know, stay alert. Don't pop in the headphones and have your face on your Instagram. Instagram's great. We all love TikTok right now, but let's not, let's not have our faces in our phones and our, you know, earbuds blasting music. We really want to be alert and aware. We want to be situationally aware, as we say, of our surroundings. Avoid using the trails during the hours, you know, dusk to dawn, anywhere at night, um, especially bike riding. Um, if you want, carry a walking stick, a whistle. You know, they have little mini ear horns. Those are great too. They make noise. They're quick fit in a pocket. Another thing you can do, it sounds goofy, and I know I sound like a crazy biologist right now, but is carrying a black, like just a small black trash bag in your pocket, like for your kitchen trash. And you can whip that out and shake it and it gets really loud and it's kind of this weird visual stimulus that animals don't really understand. And it's pretty effective at scaring them off. You can also carry bear or pepper spray if it makes you feel better when you're walking. The thing to remember with bear spray is that it is for like a bear is coming at me. There isn't, you know, it's, its ears are pinned, it's chuffing, it's huffing, it's stomping, it is approaching me, it is acting aggressive and it's actively charging at you to kind of create that barrier between you and the bear. So it is not for like, let me just spray. You know, I see a bear up ahead on the trail, let me spray just so it doesn't come at me. That's not what bear spray is for. So just being aware of the use. There are a lot of videos online on how to use it. You can also buy um, training bear spray where it's not actually like the, the ingredients that's gonna irritate your face and nose uh, and your eyes. It's just kind of practice like water stuff, essentially. So you can buy those as well and just make sure you know how to use it. But if it makes you feel better carrying it, great. I'm all for it. Human wildlife encounters, like let's say I, you do, you're on a trail, you're, you know, got your headphones in, only in one ear, you're walking with a hiking stick, everything's great, roll around a corner, there's a mountain lion or a bear, crab on a cracker, right? Now what? The thing to do is stay calm, right? I know everyone says that, but it really is, just take a deep breath, it's gonna be okay, I promise. The thing to do is avoid cornering the animal, make sure that animal has an escape route. You want to also back away slowly, like, you know, hey bear, whoa bear, hey lion, it doesn't matter what you say, just kind of calmly and slowly and speak at the animal. This just kind of lets the animal know, I'm not trying to sneak up on you. I'm letting you know I'm here. I'm backing away slowly. I'm making no sudden movements or aggression. I'm just kind of like, do to do getting away. Make sure you keep your eyes on that animal though. Don't turn your back and especially don't run, right? So let's say, you know, you have your dog, right, in your yard and you walk away from it, it's gonna be like, oh, where's mom going, or dad going, but like, okay, you run, that dog, boom, right after you, right, because you're inciting that chase instinct, and so we don't want to do that with these wildlife, and again, allow that animal space and time to escape, right, they generally, like I said, we are not on the menu, they are more afraid of us than we are of them, they want nothing to do with us nine out of ten times, and so you give them that chance and that time and space to escape, and they're going to peace out, Girl Scout, give them respect and don't approach them. So those are our biggest things as well. You know, even if you're like, oh, well, maybe it wants water. I have water from my water bottle. Don't approach them. You know, don't, they're doing okay. <laughs> they're all good in the hood. Um, don't approach these animals. They are wild animals. But if the animal does approach you, so let's say something's going on and for whatever reason, the animal is approaching you, that's when you stand your ground. You make yourself get big. You throw your arms in the air. You scream, you yell like you mean it. 
I'm not talking like a, like chastising your children. I'm talking about yelling like your life depends on it. Get as loud as you can. Try to break that, that Guinness Book of World Records <laughs> decibel level for human voice, right? That's what you're really trying to do. Let's say you do get attacked in an unfortunate situation. Don't play dead. I know there's a lot online, of, you know, or kind of in the world, like, you know, play dead, don't play dead, do this, don't do that, don't play dead. You want to fight back, make that animal work for it and make that animal think this is not worth my time. And remember, again, oftentimes they are more afraid of us than we are of them. So one of the things we say in the department is, and especially with Halloween approaching, it's kind of appropriate, is that scaring is caring. Um, hazing. So hazing is a technique where we use deterrence to immediately modify an undesirable behavior. Bears getting my trash can, toot the air horn, or you know, yell at it, clap my hands, that sort of thing. So really what we're trying to do is to train the animal to know that like, hey, that's not an acceptable behavior. You can't do that. So, you know, it can be a noisemaker, it can be an air horn, it can be a non-lethal projectile or paintballs, but that's more for law enforcement regulatory agencies. It can be pyrotechnics like bird bangers or whizzers. It can be yelling, clapping. You can toss tennis balls at the rear end of the animal, like towards that end, kind of on the ground. Don't like try to hit the animal. That's, no, don't do that. But you can generally do that and that'll also help. Um, but the other thing to understand is that hazing isn't appropriate for every species at all times of year. So if, for example, coyotes denning in that, that spring and early summer months, coyotes are gonna defend their young, right? So even if you don't necessarily see young in the area and you start hazing a coyote, it could think like, oh, I need to defend my young and it could get defensive. Same thing with mama bears in the spring. You see it like a mama bear around or you've seen cubs around, even if they're not with her at that moment or you don't see them with her at that moment, generally best to just not haze that animal. It's not the right time, it's not the right situation. So to haze animals, we use deterrents or repellents. Um, devices or methods that keep animals away from where we don't want animals. So there are all kinds of deterrents, but they're basically sensory items that discourage the animal through sight, smell, touch, sound, that sort of thing, or any combination of them. So uh, one of the things we recommend that for trash cans specifically in bears is ammonia. So again, with bear noses being that much stronger than ours, they really, pneumonia really irritates their senses. And so if you take like a Tupperware container or like a bowl of some sort, pop a sponge in there and soak it with ammonia, you're gonna have to do that a couple times a day just because of ammonia evaporates really quickly. But if you do that, then that irritates the nose and they're more worried about that irritation in the nose than they are about the trash in your trash can. We talked about air horns. Those are another great thing to use. You can use motion detecting lights, sounds. They even make motion detecting sprinkler systems. These are really great because they allow you to haze the animal or deter that animal when you're not physically present, right? And like we said, hazing is all about consistency. And so if you're not there, it can kind of be hard to consistently do that. But those devices, which are generally not terribly expensive, you can get them online or in stores, they're a great resource and we definitely recommend those. Another one is um, electric fencing. So bears have really sensitive paws and noses. If it hits their shoulder or their body, they've got all that fur not really going to affect them much, but it's similar to like an electric shock collar for a dog, right? It's a negative stimulus. It hurts for a second, but they're okay. And then they were like, okay, that getting into that, that beehive is not worth it or getting to those chickens or that garden is not worth it to me. One of the final ones we'll just talk about real quick. And if you guys have questions on others, we can definitely talk about that. But is barking dog calls played on loop over a speaker system or a radio playing music or a talk show? Doesn't really matter. Animals don't recognize like this person's singing or this person's talking. They just know that that's a human voice and they don't want to be around that. The thing that we really need to understand with deterrence is no deterrent is 100% effective 100% of the time. God, we wish they were, right? But they're not. And the other thing is that um, you need to apply a lot of different methods in combination and you need to do this consistently over time. Find what works for your animal, right? Every animal is an individual. Every animal has thing that bothers them and that doesn't bother them. So really working together as a community, again, animals don't recognize property lines, right? So working together as a community to figure out, okay, my coyotes really don't like when I use the air horn at them, or my bear really doesn't care about the air horn, but he hates when I hit him with a water gun or a hose, right? Doesn't like that at all. And so really figuring out what really works for your animal and doing it consistently. But you know, not all deterrents are effective for all species. So having a, like this owl here, doesn't really seem to work on these guys, 
but maybe it would really work for a different bird species, or maybe it would really work to keep out um, ground squirrels because they're afraid they think they're going to get eaten. So again, it really depends on the species you're talking about. One thing we do want to highlight too is that local city and county ordinances should be considered prior to using some of these deterrents. So, you know, you might have different noise ordinances in the city or different things um, with lights and sounds, those sort of things. Make sure that they're okay with city code before you go ahead and use them. One of the most common questions we get is, well, okay, why can't we just relocate the animal? Like, I don't want the animal to be hurt, but I really don't want it around. So, can we just, you know, take it over here? Unfortunately, relocation really doesn't work. Um, I really wish it did, but, but it really doesn't. Usually animals try to return to the same area. So they often they have really strong homing instincts. They know they can get their food, their water, their shelter. They've got their buddies back in this area. They've got consistent access to things that they want. And so they're gonna try to get back there. Um, so unfortunately this can lead to the animal either being killed, you know, hitting, getting hit on the road or getting killed by another um, wildlife um, species out there or they come right back. So we had a bear recently on the 210 freeway. We relocated him to open space nearby, far enough away, but you know, within a week he was back. I mean, within, a, he just bing, bang, boom, was back to the same area he was causing problems again. So unfortunately relocation doesn't really work. The other thing is it moves the problem animal to another area. So you know, we're in Southern California, right? So what is truly wild at this point? Where is an area that people aren't accessing, don't hike or camp or have cities nearby, gas stations, that sort of, like there's stuff everywhere, right? And so there's not an area where we can pop this animal that's truly, you know, true wilderness as we would think of it in our minds. The other thing too, is it often opens space for another animal to take its place. And so what I like to say, especially with coyotes, but with all wildlife species really, is let's say you've got a resident coyote in your neighborhood and it's taken a couple feral cats and you guys, are, you know, you don't want it around anymore. Understood. The thing to know with that is that you're essentially taking a 40 year old out of the area. It's mature. It understands boundaries. It knows where to go and what not to go and kind of respects that for the most part. And then you replace that with three hormonal teenagers running around causing havoc because then that territory is opened up and those animals are gonna compete. And it's the younger ones that come in and try to compete to take over that territory. So now you've got three cranky hormonal teenagers running around. So it, it's just, you know, it doesn't really take care of the problem. Um, there's also the potential to spread disease. Mange is something we deal with a lot. There are a lot of zoonotic diseases or animal diseases that, that can be transferred. And so if you take an animal from one area where disease is present, pop it over into an area where disease isn't present, then you're causing problems for the wildlife health in those areas. Ultimately, relocation doesn't fix the root of the problem. Those attractants, that food, water, shelter, they're all still there. And so without actually removing access to those resources, you're still gonna have wildlife. Wildlife belongs to each of us, right? Wildlife is in urban and suburban and rural areas, and we all have a responsibility to wildlife. We can all take simple steps to prevent conflict. We can manage the habitat around our home. We can cut back that low-lying vegetation. We can protect ourselves, our pets, our livestock with hazing and deterrence and removing attractants. We can all do these things that will allow us to kind of help us to live alongside wildlife a little more peacefully and try to reduce our conflict. So yes, CDFW, we are tasked with managing wildlife, but it's really up to each and every one of us to try to prevent conflict. So thank you guys. I know I threw a lot of information at you, but I really appreciate you taking the time to listen. Um, so my contact information is in the bottom right part of your screen. My name is Mackenzie Rich again, just for a reminder. If you guys have any wildlife incidents that you wanna report, even if it's just a, hey, I saw a bear walk down my street today. I thought it had a yellow tag. You can go ahead and report that at wildlife.ca.gov slash WIR or wildlife incident reporting system. And that's really the best way to kind of report things. You are welcome to shoot me an email. I have no problems with that but really the best way to do things for those kind of incidents is to report it through that system. The Keep Me Wild page on the Human Wildlife Conflicts Program has a lot of wonderful information about each of these species we discussed today, about deterring them, about all sorts of biological information. And in general, if you're just interested in seeing what the CDFW is and does, we are there at wildlife.ca.gov. So come take a look, friends. But with that, I think I'll hand it back to Victoria and she can kind of manage our questions. So I'm excited to see what you guys have to throw at me now. Thanks so much, Mackenzie. That was yeah. super comprehensive. I learned I learned way good more stuff. coming into this. It. Yeah, good stuff. All right, let we me have, have um, yes. Oh, gracious me, oh my. Zoom. 
How do I stop sharing? Oh. All right, can you guys still see my screen? Metal sticks and fudge stickles, Batman. All right, we're gonna figure this out together. <laughs> All right. There should be a little red thing that says stop sharing. Oh, gracious, there because, it is, friend. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> I apologize, y'all. Okay. So we have two questions. I think that's a perfect amount before we move over to Larry's presentation as well, because Larry's presentation is actually going to, like I said, dig into the a lot of the local part of what you were talking about. So our first question is from Parvin, and he says there was a big, a big bear shot by an arrow. Do you know how he is? Unfortunately, today people have seen a coyote wounded by an arrow again, wandering around. What can we do about this cruelty? Thank you. How do you guys feel, Rebecca, Jessica? You want me to take this one or you guys want to take it? You can go ahead and take it and we'll go from there. Yeah. Okay, dokie, all right, dokie. Sounds great to me. So yeah, unfortunately we are aware, we are monitoring that situation. We were out looking for that animal, specifically the bear that was shot by the arrow. Um, unfortunately, haven't had any recent reports of the animal, but we're all, we are still looking and there is still an investigation and we're trying to figure out what's going on with that guy. With the coyote with an arrow, we were out today. Jessica actually was out today um, in the area. We hadn't heard anything more about it. So if you guys have information about that, we would love to have it. Please send it our way. But we are aware of both situations and working at it. Um, with the bear, um, it was at the time archery season. So bow hunting is allowed in specific zones during certain times for bears and so that animal you know was taken during that time and coyotes are a species that can be taken at any time with any legal method of take and so we aren't really sure what the situation is surrounding that yet but technically it is allowed through through legal method of take right and i believe that our um, wildlife officers are investigating both inc incidents okay thank you Moving on to a, a question from Karen, what does a yellow tag mean? Great question, friend. So tag color means absolutely nothing. It's just whatever <laughs> tag color the biologist has on hand. We've got blue and green and orange and yellow. I will say though, what tag the ear is in does generally mean something, though occasionally we get this wrong, <laughs> just because of the way the situation is. If it's in the right ear, the bear's right ear, it's typically a female because women are always right. And if it's in the left ear, it typically means a male. So that's just a quick way to identify, you know, what gender you're looking at with the bear. Yeah, and we're required. We're we are required every time we go hands on with an animal to put an ear tag in in the animal's ear. So that just means that that animal's been hand handled before. Perfect. Thank you. And I'll just chime in real fast as well. Um, if you're also curious about number, same thing, totally arbitrary. If you've ever caught a number and wondered, I wonder which one this one is or what that means. Again, just whatever tag is available on hand. Wonderful. Thank you. So we have more questions that have come in, but I'm actually going to turn it over to Larry first. So please keep writing in your questions. These are great. I can tell people are really uh, getting energized by this information and you may have even more questions after Larry's presentation. Terrific. Thank you so much, Mackenzie and Victoria. Appreciate you guys. Uh, let me start working on sharing my screen here in just a second. And just a little bit more about, uh, let's see here. You guys should be able to see my screen now, correct? Okay, well, a little bit about myself. My name is Larry Brasita. As you um, heard earlier, I'm the public safety manager here in the city of Duarte. I operate out of the uh, sheriff substation or the Duarte Public Safety Office. For those of you that may or may not know where that's at, uh, may have shopped at the Target Shopping Center. I am at the little police station right next to Target. So where you see all those black and white police cars, that's my office, that's where I'm located. I manage the day-to-day -day operations of um, basically the department. Uh, which also includes animal control, uh, code enforcement, and um, homeless outreach. And we have a lot of different law enforcement services here. Obviously, you know, you have a probation department, we have the LA County Sheriff's Department, and even liaison with the LA County Fire Department. So 
kind of manage all the day-to-day -day operations of that. And uh, today we're here to really talk about coexisting with wildlife. So I think Mackenzie did an excellent job of presenting a lot of good information for everybody to kind of um, digest. And I just want to talk a little bit more about what we particularly see here in the city of Duarte. So what are the kind of calls for service that Duarte residents call in about? Um, we get pretty much a lot of what McKinsey was mentioning. We get the bears, the coyotes, mountain lions, bobcats, snakes, uh, deers, raccoons, possums, skunks, bats, dogs, cats, and feral cats. Um, so there is a difference between what a feral cat is and a normal cat. Uh, usually you can kind of tell from a feral cat to a regular cat. I do have some a photograph later in my presentation that kind of shows you the difference. But more importantly, the big determinant is, is that how they look, right? Are they well kept? Do they look fed well? Um, you know, they have, you know, any type of skin issues or stuff like that. That's usually signs of a feral cat versus a uh, community cat or someone's pet is because a someone who's not taking care of that animal or it's kind of out in the wild, will usually pick up something from the wild and that sort of thing and be a little bit more uncut be a more unkept and then obviously not want to be around human beings at all because it is obviously wants to be more into the wild than it does with the community. So uh, those are some of the small differences that we kind of notice between the feral cats and the regular cats or even community cats. Uh, and I'll go into a little bit more detail later, but um, what do we kind of do? How do we respond locally um, when we talk about the bears, coyotes, mountain lions, bobcats, deers? What do you do in those situations, right? I think Mackenzie gave you a lot of good information, some of which I'm going to repeat again, um, but how do we handle that? What do we do as the City of Duarte Animal Control Agency to kind of help better inform, educate, and respond to animal situations? Well, we do that by a couple of different things. We do hazing tactics, um, which is an excellent thing that we do because we try to keep the animals in the wild. We don't want them interfacing at all, like Mackenzie was mentioning, with the, the public, because if they get comfortable with human beings and they make it their home, I've seen uh, situations where the bear comes over a particular property more frequently, and then maybe that 15 square miles, 10 square miles is now shrinking down to five square miles, down to one square mile, and then eventually it goes to zero. And when I say zero, it's because usually what happens is we see these wild animals actually take up dens on people's properties. So they will do that because they feel that comfortable with the area that they're in. They're being fed, they have water, they have shelter, a lot of vegetation, there's piles, there's uh, sometimes even storage sheds that we've seen that they try to uh, live next to or sometimes in underneath properties. Um, it's a great resource for them because you got to remember uh, if we're very comfortable where we live, they're going to be even more comfortable <laughs> because they're used to the wild. They're used to sleeping on rocks and uh, having food miles and miles away from them. But when we can make all that nutritional items available to them readily at any point in time, then they're going to feel more comfortable and not want to go anywhere else, right? Just like we. If we, if we have everything we need and we can sit on that couch, watch TV, do whatever we want to do, we're not going to get up. And they're going to be the same way. They're going to want to stay in that uh, smaller area because why defend the larger area when we can have everything we need in a much smaller uh, pocket? So um, coyotes, mountain lions, uh, bobcats, deer, those are the type of things, a lot of the things that we talked about, um, especially McKinsey mentioned about trying to keep remove the food sources and that sort of thing, is a real, real huge factor in keeping those animals away from your areas. So we always want to make sure that we keep them out of your areas because what ends up happening is the bears, the coyotes, those type of things will eventually go into your household and create all those property damage. And when we have property damage, that sort of thing, sometimes you may even be inside your household. We've had had situation where bears have gone into people's houses while they're home um, and they've had to barricade themselves because they're rummaging through the refrigerator, um, going up and down, and they even got a little lost. The, the animal was trying to escape and it couldn't because as it entered, it broke down the door, it blocked its own exit, so it had nowhere else for it, for it. it had nowhere else to go. So it's really important that we try to do as much hazing tactics as humanly possible. If you're around and you see the, if you see the bears or wildlife or that sort of thing, kind of roaming around your backyard or in your front yard, you want to use some of the tactics that we talked about earlier and scaring them away. Uh, but mind you, we have a lot of tools at our disposal to help residents with those situations. So don't, if you don't feel comfortable, you have an elderly parent or relative that lives in the foothill communities and they don't have the ability or physical capability to do any hazing tactics or anything like that, or even set up devices for them, um, we can come out and help in those situations. So when you have the bear, you have the coyotes, you have the mountain lions, 
and they're kind of scoping the area out and kind of lingering around, give us a call. We will help respond to those situations and help try to motivate them into their wild habitat. Uh, snakes. Now, snakes, we try to relocate uh, whenever we have the snake. So if you do have a snake on your property, we go around and we will capture them. However, they do have to be in a confined space. Uh, same thing is true with some of your other animals. And now if they just come in and they come out, you know, that's just the way it is. We, would, we want to try to stay to deterring them from your property in the first place. That's going to be your best tactics. But if you have them that are really trying to linger around your property, they're hanging around your pool, they're hanging around your barbecue, they're not really going anywhere else, give us a call. It's really important that we try to get them away from the area and feel uncomfortable. So snakes, we, we go out there, if they are confined to an area, maybe in a flower bed or near your front door, sometimes we have responded to a situation where a snake does go into your household. Uh, we will go in there and obviously remove the snake. Uh, but other than that, if they're just roaming around and we're not going to go chase them, it's very hard and difficult to chase down a snake. Um, however, rattlesnakes tend to kind of take up a little den area. If you do come across a rattlesnake in your property um, and you can locate it, you can see it. Uh, more importantly, then we will respond. One thing to note that we do not relocate rattlesnakes. We do dispatch them, meaning that we do remove their head because uh, they are venomous. There's a, a lot of hazards in dealing with a uh, rattlesnake. And we obviously don't want your pets or anything else to um, be bitten by the poisonous snake. So we do take particular cautions and we do have to remove their head just because we have the fangs and that sort of thing. We have a special service that we contract out with just so we can dispose of the body um, humanely and then also safely. So it doesn't hit any other humans or any other animals. Uh, raccoons and possums, bats, we really don't respond to those situations unless they're injured or deceased. Um, and that's true for all the other situations. Um, if you have any type of animal that injured or deceased, whether that's a bear um, or a deer, uh, we do pick up deer off your property. If the animal is way far up into the mountainside and we're kind of unable to get that or get our equipment in that area, then we won't be able to obviously retrieve the animal. However, if it is on your property, if it's in the street, anywhere where a human can access, we will go out there and we will take care of the problem, with, uh, no issue at all. So just keep that in mind if it is injured. Uh, usually when we say injured, it has to be immobilized. So if the raccoon is not going anywhere, it's, it's limping and it's barely dragging along, it's something where we can pick up by our hands, then we will take care of that. Obviously we have specialized equipment for where we kind of handle them, um, but just kind of keep that as kind of your threshold on how we respond to that. Uh, a lot of times we respond to them in traps as well. So if you have a trap, um, we do service traps. I'll get into that in just a minute. But if you have them in traps, we will go ahead and service them, either let them loose and or um, move them down the block or usually within the same vicinity. But one thing I want to, uh, to note with all these animals that we're kind of talking about is, is that if you're in that foothill community, you want to make sure that you keep your small pets and even kids um, inside uh, when you can. And then when they're outside, because obviously kids like to go outside, animals need to go to the restroom. We all well aware of that, uh, but make sure that they're supervised. I'm not saying that kids, you know, are, are often picked out by any particular species of animal, but it is important that you do keep them supervised because um, unlike some other areas, you know, when you do live in the foothill communities, it is important that you're cognizant because at the end of the day, you know, bears, we talked about kind of the size of a bear, you know, 150, 250, 350 pounds. Um, those bears, they might not physically try to harm a human being or do any damage, but at the same time, they're a large animal. And even if they get startled or scared by a small child or a dog and they run away, they will trample that animal and or small child and that can cause a lot of harm. Um, I've seen harm done to humans that they didn't even know they came out of their home. Uh, they walked to their car and then sure enough, there was a bear right on the other side. They unlocked their car door. And before you know it, the bear got startled turned around, had nowhere to go except right where that human being was coming at them and going to their vehicle. So it did uh, knock them over and it does cause harm. Um, so you gotta be cognizant and aware that uh, these situations are true and it does happen. So just make sure that you're always supervising, especially those small animals when you're talking about uh, predatory animals like coyotes, they tend to pick off a lot of your small animals, including your cats. Uh, your dogs and that sort of thing. So you really wanna keep them in at night, especially because that's when they're uh, on the hunt. Uh, one thing I will mention in addition to the fish and wildlife section that uh, McKinsey mentioned is that we do have a local ordinance about feeding uh, feeding wildlife prohibited. So no person shall feed realistically any of the animals that I mentioned, uh, bears, deers, 
uh, mice, rats, skunks, squirrels, or even feral cats. Uh, it really is important that we don't uh, perpetuate the cycle by feeding these animals and making them more comfortable with human beings. We want them to feel uncomfortable. The more uncomfortable they feel with human beings, the longer they will live, I guarantee it. Um, when they come out and they interact with humans and they start this generational cycle of teaching their young that humans are okay and feeding and that sort of thing, it really, really creates a serious problem. And then our calls for service just continue to grow. I've been uh, working for the city of Duarte for almost 20 years and I have seen many different generations of bears and coyotes and that sort of thing that are learning from the parents. We've actually learned to identify some of our frequent flyers as we like to call them of the bears and coyotes. And we're starting to see that their, um, their pups and their young and, their, and, and everything, their offspring are doing the same thing that the parents were doing. And that's because they're learning directly from the parents. So it is important if you do see any of your neighbors, please let them know. And if you don't feel comfortable letting them know, or you just wanna let us know, uh, let us know, we will go out there, we will educate the resident, let them know that it is illegal to feed wildlife. I know it's, it's like you feel like you're doing a good thing. I get it, I totally understand. I know my job is to help animals at the end of the day, but this really does not help them long-term. It helps them in the short-term, but it does not help them in the long-term. So just keep that in mind. Another thing, even you know, poisoning those type of animals uh, is gonna be a bad thing. That's why some of the raccoons, possum, mites, that sort of thing is included in that. Um, because poison can create another issue, right? If the, if the mice or the rats eat the poison, they go out and maybe you're in a foothill community, they go out, they pass away. Sometimes, a lot of times they pass away on the property, which becomes very hard to track down. They create an odor. Not only that, but then they tend to uh, go outside of the property and maybe they'll die in the foothill somewhere, which, okay, great. It doesn't harm you, right? It doesn't smell, no issue. The big problem is, is that another animal will come out and consume that carcass. And that, that animal that's now consuming it is going to ingest a lot of that poison. And then another animal is going to come around and ingest that animal. So you can see that it does create a, a lot of cycle and that's gonna be a lot of animals that we're gonna have to pick up. And again, we're here to protect the animals and protect the humans. So we wanna make sure that we have that delineation, that separation between the humans and the animals. So therefore we can kind of coexist, right? Um, eliminate all the food sources. Your garbage cans are a great resource, an absolute great resource um, for animals, all animals, coyotes, uh, bears, now, the big difference between uh, the coyotes and the bears is obviously the bears are a lot larger and um, they can go out, they have their paws, they can get on their hind legs, they can pull down the trash can, tip it over like you can see in our photo, and then really just go to town. They'll rummage through all those different things. Another thing that we have is fallen fruit. So fruit that is real ripe on the tree um, or that has fallen and starting to rot really sends off a huge odor. Um, that odor, as you heard earlier, I mean, they have a tremendous, tremendous uh, ability to smell for long distances. So when they have that ability and you have that food that's running, that things, oh, wow, that's a food source uh, for them to consume. So they gravitate towards that. I mean, it, it's like a metal, it's like a metal and magnet. So they're going to come out and they're going to enjoy that. Uh, outdoor pet feeding. So that goes even for your dogs and your cats and you're feeding them outdoors. There's other animals, your feral cats, um, your bobcats, there's all kinds of different animals that will go out and consume what you're trying to feed your pet. And that's again, another attract. So if possible, at all times, try to feed your, try to feed your pets indoors. Um, it is important because it does, uh, you know, that smell is the big attractor to them. Uh, bird feeders, although it doesn't sound like it'd be a big deal, bird feeders, we do see bears especially get into bird feeders quite often. And don't think just because you put a bird feeder in a tree, that, oh, it's in a tree, it's high up, it's like 15 feet high, not a, not, not a worry, I got a pole, I can get it down, I can refill it. Bears are very, very good climbers. I have seen bears actually go up a, a tree and literally fall asleep on the tree limbs. That's how good of climbers they are. Uh, so I do not recommend at all that you have those bird feeders accessible. Um, try to keep them if you can, like on a wire, maybe between the tree and your house. Um, therefore, there's nothing that they can really grab onto or climb up to get. The, you, only you can access it with like a pole or some type of utility line um, so you can refill that bird feeder. Another big thing that we always see is barbecues, uh, dirty barbecues, especially in the foothills. Uh, when you have your barbecues, please make sure you clean the drip pan, make sure you clean the grill really well, use a disinfectant or deodorant or deodorizer. Um, you know, ammonia works well, uh, even 
uh, just kind of your uh, normal cleaners on there just to kind of get rid of all the smells and juices that are on there because that again is another thing very similar to your fallen fruit in your garbage they'll get in there uh, heavy vegetation Again, we've seen it where we have those heavy vegetation areas along with you know, piles of maybe wood or block or that sort of thing. Literally, they will start to create their own little den, basically their own home. The den is another word for home. So they'll create their own little home and uh, that's their place. They're like, hey, this is my stake. This is where I live now. I'm not paying rent at all, but you know, I'm paying rent with my good looks. That's what they say. So you got to make sure that uh, you kind of keep that area as clean as possible, because not only do the larger animals, the bobcats, the, the mountain lions, well, not so much the mountain lions, but the, uh, your feral cats and your, your bears, um, those things will take refuge in there. But then also you have your raccoons, your possums, and all these other things that you don't want interacting with your household pets or even humans. Like we mentioned, uh, like McKinsey mentioned, there's a lot of zoonotic diseases. Zoonotic means that it can be passed from an animal to a human. So it's not just a sickness that they can get and we can't. It literally can pass back and forth. So you got to make sure that you're cognizant of that and keep that in mind that that's what we're trying to prevent. We're trying to prevent that spread of disease and illness uh, between both the animals and the humans and then the humans to the animals. Um, <clears throat> bleach works really well. Uh, unscented ammonia and even pine saw. We've seen pine saw actually work in our community fairly well. Um, any type of disinfectant really works and deodor deodorizer works really well. But those are the three most common that we see that works. And one thing I will mention about the pine saw is, is that you really wanna try to use the oil base. They do make two, two different versions. They make, the most common version is gonna be your liquid form, like your concentrate. And then they also make another one that is more of an oily base type. It's a little thicker. Um, and usually that's kind of used like on a rag and that sort of thing to wipe down surfaces. I recommend that one a little bit more. And the reason why I say that is because with the other two items, they tend to evaporate. So you have the bleach that evaporates, you know, it's really water, more, more liquidy. Um, you have your ammonia that tends to evaporate. Uh, so we, we notice is that with the oil kind of based pine salt, it does give off that strong odor that the uh, animals don't like. And, but at the same time, it doesn't evaporate as quickly. So make sure you kind of clean your garbage cans, use those items, uh, secure your windows and doors and also your trash cans. I do have a segment on um, particular trash cans that Vertec does provide for uh, Doherty residents. Uh, compost piles, if you guys have those, uh, but that's great, but they can be a serious attractant. So you do want to try to use some of the scents above. You can even put a little pan of uh, pine saw or that sort of thing, um, or ammonia, unscented ammonia around the area, again, because that does give off that scent and odor. So just be cognizant though, because it isn't a pail, you know, other animals that you might have or your children might get to it. So if that doesn't work, that's fine. We understand that. Maybe you can spray a little bit or clean the outside that will really help uh, bring them uh, the odors down for the animals that's an attractant. Um, another thing you can even do is you can have that same little bowl. You can keep it on your window seal, um, like say in your kitchen, if you have it on your kitchen window seal, you can create little things there. And again, it gives off that smell and odor because we have seen a lot of bears try to enter uh, people's homes through their open windows in their kitchen, because obviously the kitchen is where you're gonna store all your food. And that's what they love to see. That's what they want. To, that's what they want. So if you can kind of keep something like that and then spray around your window sills, your door sills, that sort of thing, it really helps mask the food smell. So you don't have a lot of those situations where you're going to have the bear entering into your property. <clears throat> Some other things that we have seen uh, quite a bit in Duarte is obviously you can see our bears kind of hanging around your pools areas. They're cooling off. Hey, it's been 110 degrees this past week, so I completely understand. Um, so they want to do the same thing. They want to cool off. They want to enjoy. They want to get nourishment. They want to get water, that sort of thing. So you want to just be cognizant, not saying that you don't need a pool, don't shouldn't have a pool, but just be aware that that's going to be a source for them to come by, right? So you're trying to eliminate as many sources as you have. So if you have a pool, and you have a tree, and you have unlocked garbage cans, and you have no, no deodorizers inside your trash cans or that sort of thing, this is gonna be a prime location for them, right? So you wanna to try to eliminate as many possibilities or attractants as humanly possible so that they feel discouraged from coming around there. And then that's a, another reason why we do our hazing technique. Uh, another small item is uncoordinated pools. You do wanna um, make sure that if you have like kiddie pools or that sort of thing that you fill up during the day, you do wanna make sure you unfill those, you kind of empty those out into your yard. 
And the reason why is because we do see that a lot of the wildlife will come to those small pools. Uh, they'll smell that it doesn't have any chlorine or any chemicals in it, and they'll drink right out of there. Uh, again, and there's a lot of bacteria in those animals' mouths. There's a lot of things that can be spread in there. So you don't really want that to be hanging around your, your, your yard or uh, come in contact with you. But in addition to that, if you leave it too long, sometimes you forget. Uh, you know, mosquitoes can grow. Um, mosquitoes can grow very rapidly. So you want to make sure that you kind of empty those pools out uh, whenever possible. And then when they are chlorinated, just keep up with the chlorine, that sort of thing, and just be cognizant that that's going to be one of the attractors that we see in our community. Um, some of the items that we have is our local harvest. So the local harvest is a, um, is a program that we run for our Doherty residents. And what it is, is basically we have our teams that volunteer their time and they come out to your property and they will literally pick all your fruit off your tree. So the great thing about it is it gives you the opportunity to interact. Um, it also is, it, it takes away some of the attractants from the animals, right? Um, prevents them from even getting to the ground in the first place and rotting away and messing up your yard and are bringing all those other wild animals. Uh, and then you, it's going to be two things. Not only are you helping the animals by not having them around your, your property and in your trees, but we also donate that to the Foothill Unity Center. So that's another thing. So we do feed other people with the fruit that we get from your tree. So don't think that this is all going to waste. It's gonna be a great, um, it's gonna be a great thing that you're gonna be doing for both the animals and for human beings. Uh, give that number a call, Ada Torres is our um, crime prevention specialist and she's in charge of the program. So you can give her a call at the number. It's the same number that I'm gonna provide at the end and her extension is 316 or you can feel free to email her. Um, most of the times the pickups is uh, Tuesdays and Thursdays. Right now we have it narrowed down to just Thursdays, uh, anytime after 4 p.m. Usually that's when kids get out of school. So uh, if you are interested in that program, please give us a call. We will help you um, with any of those situations. Uh, next thing that we have is our bear proof trash can. Now there are a lot of residents in the Foothill communities that are already participate in this program. Uh, one thing I will mention is, is that we are changing uh, because of the state law we are changing how we handle our waste. So uh, starting actually already begun, starting September 1st, you have to put all of your uh, food waste products. So your chicken bones, your unused food, uh, your, your leftover lettuce, all those things, maybe the stuff that's been sitting in your fridge that you have to throw out is now gonna have to go into your green bins. So just keep that in mind that that is a lot irrelevant of the animal situation. Um, that they will have to be going into your green bin, no longer your black bin. However, um, they do make both a uh, lockable device for the green and the black bins. So they are a complete unit. So for $8 a month, you can obtain uh, a trash can where Burtek will come out in service. It does have a locking device. It's real easy to use. Just kind of put your two fingers together on the front there and then it opens a lid and the machine, when it picks it up, it tilts it completely over. And when it tilts completely over, it undoes the latch as well. So um, they have seen great success with uh, animals not being able to enter into those trash cans. Uh, residents do have the older version right now. This is the brand new version. Uh, if you do have the older version, which is still the black version, um, you have the option to either trade in your black can and get the green can and or you can buy both the green and the black can, but just keep in mind that it is $8 per can. Uh, if you do keep your old can, your old black can, and then just obtain just the green can, uh, Burtek is giving a discount for that. And uh, I, I think um, I'll allow um, Victoria to kind of fill you in on that exact dollar amount and how that works. But if you want more information, please don't hesitate to contact Burtek at the phone number there. And like I said, we wanna to try to keep it as hard as humanly possible for animals to get into your food and into your garbage area. Uh, another thing that we do, kind of uh, McKinsey mentioned that earlier, is contact with wildlife. So never turn and run away. Uh, very important. I got to highlight that as humanly possible, right? Because at the end of the day, you got to make sure that an animals are very instinctive when they see something like a uh, like their prey, turn and run away. They think I'm going to run after it right? Just like a dog, just like anything else. So all animal species are pretty much the same. So don't do that. It does trigger something in your mind. Be dominant. Don't be submissive. Make sure they let, let them know you're there. You're dominant. Make yourself be as big as humanly possible. Don't be the guy on the right-hand side of this photograph here. Uh, you want to yell, throw rocks, spray your hose, whatever you want to do. And like I said, if you don't feel comfortable with doing a lot of those hazing techniques, there are devices you can buy on Amazon. You can go to Home Depot. Um, there's a lot of things that you can purchase to kind of make it more um, 
a better deterrent for, for the animals to enter your property. Um, but again, we go out there and we can haze the animals ourselves. So some of the, we have a lot of different equipment that we utilize. Uh, we have a lot of, we have hazing techniques. So one thing that we utilize is tranquilizers. Now you think, well, that's not really a hazing technique. And you're absolutely right, it's not. Uh, I mentioned that in this segment because that is our last resort. We really, really do not want to tranquilize any type of animal at all. Um, and one of the main reasons why is because it doesn't solve the problem. Um, relocating, like Mackenzie mentioned, does not solve any of the issues. There's other animals that enter the territory. Um, you know, there's other offspring of that animal that are just going to pick up where that animal left off. And case in point, um, we did have uh, quite a few bears that we've we've had to deal with in our community. Uh, one bear in particular is, was a problem bear. It kept going into people's property um, and it was becoming a hazard and dangerous. So what ended up happening is they ended up um, tranquilizing that bear and we took it about 50 to 60 miles away. 50 to 60 miles, that's a long distance, 50 to 60 miles. Um, that bear was back the very next day. Within 24 hours, that bear came right back to our community. Uh, obviously, the bear was tagged. It has a number on it, so we're able to identify that it was exact that exact bear. Uh, another reason why we do tag or why the tag is required whenever we uh, interact or even tranquilize a bear is because, like McKinsey mentioned, uh, bears, uh, for example, can't be hunted. And if a um, hunter does actually um, take down that animal and consumes the meat, then they'll be consuming that uh, drug that we use to tranquilize them as well. So it's another little reason um, why we have, there's a lot of reasons why we have to be careful about when we tranquilize animals. We don't like to tranquilize animals at all. Um, it is very dangerous and it's not very helpful and good for the animal itself. Uh, some of the things that we do do as far as hazing techniques is beanbag rounds. So as you can see on the left-hand side, we do have a 12 gauge shotgun. We have specialized uh, rounds that we utilize. It's used for animal control purposes. And usually we hit them in the rear hind leg area just to kind of scoot them and get them along. Uh, those devices, actually all these devices, paintball gun, tennis balls, um, all these devices um, are allowed by our agency. And what we do is we use that so that even when they see us and they hear, uh, hear us walking or see us with something in our hands, they immediately get scared and they immediately take off running. So it isn't a very, it's a very effective tool that we utilize um, and we know it's effective because as soon as they see us, they go running and a lot of times they don't come back to the same area. So if you do have that problem situation where the bear is hanging around, we give us a call, let us know, especially when the bear is there, we will respond and we will try our hazing techniques to get them uh, moving into the wilderness area. Uh, one thing I want to touch on is trapping. So um, traps, if you do have traps, uh, traps must be inspected and animals removed at least once a day. It is a law. Uh, so you got to be careful when you are trapping. You cannot trap wildlife. So let me make that clear. Uh, you cannot trap wildlife unless you have a permit to do so. So you do have to get that um, from the Department of Fish and Wildlife. Um, but you don't need it if you're trapping like rodents, for example, or that sort of thing that you're trying to remove from the property. Um, and any trap, it, so, but we do service those traps. So if you have a, a trap and you accidentally catch a raccoon, you catch a squirrel or something that you really weren't intending to capture, we will go out there, we will help you. We will um, uh, service a trap, meaning pick it up. And usually we have to relocate it within the direct area that it was captured from. So don't think that because you capture that animal that we are just gonna go ahead and take it 50 miles away. We do not do that. Uh, we can't. We actually have to leave it within our community. Um, so it is important that you're kind of aware that trapping is not another resource that you can really use to try to get rid of a problem. You need to look at your own particular property and figure out ways. And give us a call. We're more than well. We're more than happy to go out there and give you some advice and tips if you have a particular problem or issue um, to kind of help uh, mitigate some of the problems that you're having. Uh, another thing is is that they're really attracted to the food. I can't stress that enough. So make sure you take care of those problems and situations um, because it's otherwise you're just going to continue to have the perpetual cycle. Um, feral cats. So if you do uh, by chance pick up a feral cat, um, we will impound and take uh, feral cats. Not a problem as you can see from the background photograph. Here's an example of a feral cat. You can see it's pretty untidy, unkept. Uh, it's kind of free roaming. It's never been around human. It doesn't like human interaction at all. Um, it has kind of a snarly hiss to it um, rather than a high-pitched hiss. 
Um, those are the type of things that kind of differentiate from a regular cat to a feral cat. If you do capture that, we will intake your feral cats. We will impound the cats. But the likelihood of a feral cat getting adopted or rehabilitated are slim to none. Um, that is the reality of the situation. So we do not recommend that you obviously capture those cats. However, sometimes those cats do create problems. They're over there eating your, they're interacting with your pets. They're interacting with your cats, that sort of thing. We completely understand that. But just know that there is the reality to the situation that it's really difficult to rehabilitate and or take care of those cats anywhere else. So um, if they are community cats, however, meaning that they're kind of well-kept, they're being fed by somebody in the neighborhood, um, they may be not necessarily like human interaction, but at the same time, they don't want to go, um, they do go near your property and or kind of hang around and wait for you to feed them or give them water, that sort of thing. Those are more considered community cats. And like I said, because the likelihood of any cat really coming out of the shelter in the first place uh, is not very high, it's really, really important that you know that we will release a community cat back. We are working on some different programs. We're just trying to find the resources. Uh, in the future, we're looking for like kind of a trap, neuter and release program where we actually get community cats, for example, and uh, we'll get them, we will neuter them or spay them and um, release them back to the community. Now, it doesn't solve the problem that why they were there in the first place. However, it does kind of stop the growth cycle. So that's really a program that we're looking for in the future and hopefully within the next uh, year or so, we'll be able to bring that out to you. Uh, another call that we kind of get that I wanted to touch on today, and I'll be wrapped up here in just a second, is peacocks. Um, we don't trap peacocks. We, we get that quite often. Um, that's something that we really don't. They're kind of in between. Uh, they're really just considered just birds, free roaming birds. Um, so we will only respond to peacocks if they are injured and or deceased. And again, the injury has to be where they're immobilized. So if they have kind of a limp and that sort of thing, we really just kind of want to let them be. Uh, hopefully, it'll heal themselves. Uh, but at the same time, because a lot of times we have to capture any animal, even if, especially a peacock, uh, in capturing an animal and trying to help it will actually a lot of times hurt it. Because you know we obviously have to confine it. We have to hold it down. It's going to peck. It's going to. It could make the injury even worse. Say it was maybe a fractured leg. Now it's completely broken. Um, there's all kinds of different things that occur when we try to impound animals, especially wild animals. So we, we don't interact too much with peacocks. I know sometimes they can be a little bit of a nuisance and scratch vehicles and that sort of thing. Uh, but just keep in mind that it's, it's really important that you just kind of uh, scoot them away, make loud noises, that sort of thing, make them feel uncomfortable with the area. And, uh, but at the same time, they are just a free roaming bird. So we just have to be cognizant of that. Um, here's our information. In case you wanted to get a hold of us, we are open Monday through Thursday and Friday and Saturday. Uh, we do have a contract sheltering service that is with San Gabriel Valley Humane. Um, however, they only respond to emergency situation off hours and also Temple Station. So if you do have an emergency situation, uh, give Temple Station a call and uh, let them know what you have. If you have a dog running loose, um, they, that's not really considered an emergency situation. However, the dog is running in and out of traffic, then that is considered an emergency situation. If you've been bitten by a dog and or a dog did to harm another animal, that sort of thing, give them a call, they will respond. Um, otherwise, we respond to pretty much everything. Uh, as you kind of heard what calls for service and the type of animals that we respond to, wildlife, domesticated animal, we, we kind of do it all. Uh, and we do that for the benefit of our residents. There's not a lot of animal control agencies actually do what we do. Um, we are one of the rarities. We go, uh, realistically, if you compare us to other agencies, we go above and beyond for our residents. So if you have a situation, you need help, you need advice, you need some um, help hazing, uh, particular wildlife, that sort of thing, give us a call, especially when they're there actively. Uh, and we can go out there, assess the situation, and uh, figure how best we can approach it. Again, because of the different seasons, there's all kinds of different things that happen with that animal, whether it has cubs or young, um, you know, that does impact how we treat the animal. And I understand that you may not be familiar or understand those things. So always give us a call. We're more than willing to come out and help and participate any which way we can. Uh, I'm, I'm open to any questions. And then Victoria, if you had, uh, if you wanted to chime in on the uh, trash can, sorry, I think I, I saw you pop up there for a second. So <laughs> please feel free no. to throw the evidence in or answer. It's no problem. Do you mind actually going back to that slide real quick? Yes, absolutely. So just a, on trash in particular, quick recap, because of SB 1383 and the new state law that's in place regarding how organics are taken care of, um, your food waste should be mixed in with your 
yard waste in your green barrel. Um, and a few tips and tricks on that as we implement that program. Yes, we are rolling out bear containers. And so if you want to um, get one of those, you just reach out to Bird Tech and that's an additional $8 per month, uh, as Larry was saying. If you already have a black barrel that is uh, a bear container you can, and want to keep that, you can keep that and it will be reduced down to a $4 per month rate. If you don't want to keep your black barrel as a bear container, you can trade it in for a regular barrel, but we caution against that only because bears and other animals may still be attracted to items even in your black barrel. Obviously in your green barrel, it's even more so, but there may still be some things in your black barrel. And then I know this was touched upon um, in the other presentation as well, but with your trash barrels, it's even more important now uh, with your food waste just so like readily accessible. It's not even gonna be in a bag, no bags in your green containers, please, please, please. Um, <clears throat> you'll wanna be making sure that you do wash your cans out afterwards, that you keep them in a building and that you also um, don't, not only do you not put your containers out uh, on the street or in your backyard accessible to the wildlife, but if you have food waste, try and keep it in your house in either a container that has a lid, so a used coffee can, Tupperware, um, or even a bag, a plastic bag that you put in the freezer to also mitigate odor. Just remember that when it's uh, trash day, take that plastic bag out um, and empty the what's in the bag into the container and not the uh, put the whole bag in. Again, no bags, unfortunately, our um, waste hauler cannot process uh, bags, even compostable bags. That's it for trash. Uh, I'm going to, Larry, we had a question for you. And I know that um, we had a few questions for the other presenters as well that Jessica luckily already typed out the answer. So I'll just read those out. But the question for you, Larry, is what's the protocol when we see an injured wildlife or that's, that's injured or possibly diseased? What's the protocol here in the city of Doherty? You obviously said it a little bit in here, but just what is, uh, recap that one more time. What's the protocol? Yeah, no problem. So uh, a lot of times if you see an animal, um, you know, you can always give us a call if it's, if you see an animal that looks injured, um, obviously over the phone or uh, our dispatchers are trained to, to kind of assess over the phone say, hey, well, is it moving? Is it confined? That sort of thing. So if you don't know what the situation is, always just give us a call. We'll be more than happy to give you the appropriate information. But for the most part, if you see an injured uh, animal, uh, give us a call. Just let us know. It doesn't hurt just to even let us know that the animal is injured. So for example, if you have a deer um, that has uh, maybe it's, it's one of its legs is kind of dragging behind or it, you can tell it's kind of hurt. Uh, give us a call. More than likely, we won't handle that animal because, again, we don't want to interact more than we humanly have to. Um, so, but uh, a lot of times we'll go out, we'll take a look at the animal, assess it. Now, if it's completely immobilized, where it's not moving or it's dragging itself across a lot yard or even in the street, um, what we will do is we will go out there, we will pick that animal. So we'll get it treated. We have a local veterinarian that we deal with, an emergency veterinarian that we deal with as well, um, and our shelter. So uh, it, it is hard a lot of times to deal with like the diseased animals and uh, making sure that they're rehabilitated. There are services out there that we contract out with a lot of uh, different agencies and organizations to write, rehabilitate, um, even bats. We actually have an organization that we work with to rehabilitate bats. So if we have an injured bat or something like that, it does get tested and they do um, rehabilitate them. So uh, we try to do the best we can and uh, I do not recommend at all that you touch anything that looks sick or diseased and definitely keep or disinfect the area. If you have like a, a coyote or something like that or a bear that was kind of foaming at the mouth, whatever, um, kind of dragging itself, that sort of thing, you really, really don't want to interact with that animal at all. But let us know. Give us a call. We do go out there. We assess the animal. If we do find that there's something a little iffy about, then a lot of times we'll call uh, myself included. I've called Rebecca myself said, Rebecca, got a situation for you. <laughs> this is what I got. What do you think? And, uh, you know, we'll go back and forth, uh, show her some videos, some photographs, that sort of thing. And she'll give us a lot of sound advice. Um, there's a lot of times, especially with wildlife, we interact as animal control agency heavily with wildlife. Uh, that's not always true with a lot of different agencies. And what's good is uh, we interact well with uh, Department of Fish and Wildlife. So Rebecca and McKenzie, and uh, we communicate uh, regularly. So when we have situation or problems and even anything, if we have 
uh, you know, dead animals, for example, we're saying, hey, Rebecca, we have a high volume of this particular species of animal that has been passing away in this particular area. Uh, you know, they go out there, they assess it, they look at it, they find out, well, is someone poisoning it? Is uh, there something with the ecosystem or what they're feeding on? Um, you know, there's all kinds of different things, all kinds of factors that they examine and look at. But uh, for the most part, don't do anything with them. Try, don't interact with them at all. Uh, give us a call. We'll go out there. We'll help them. Um, like I said, if they're really just kind of, you know, they're a little hurt, you know, maybe they got with a different type of predator. Uh, it does happen. Just kind of let them be for the most part, but you can still always give us a call so we can kind of keep it on our radar. Because then if we find out one day, okay, it was limping. The next day we get a different call. Well, now there's two legs that are not working, right? Now it's three legs and we can see the progression. We can see that there's something else going on with this animal besides just a physical injury. It could be something more internal. Okay. Um, two, two questions from Kai here. After picking up an injured animal, does it go to the Humane Society to get metal, medical attention? It sounds like it does get medical attention depending on the animal. Correct. Yeah, and not necessarily correct. from the Humane Society. Okay. Yeah, and then what is, yeah. what is the name of the bat organization? You know, that that is a great question. I don't have their name off the top of my head. Um, I just know the people that I deal with, unfortunately, I apologize. Uh, but they are uh, they're a little bit of a distance away. Um, they actually gave us, um, I don't have any photographs or it with me, but all of our animal control officers actually have particular cages. They're like little tiny, um, almost like organized cages. And they just kind of put the bats inside there and allows them to hang and kind of droop and it has ventilation and that sort of thing. They actually provided all of those uh, uh, cages, if you will, for us. So. Um, they are very extremely helpful. They're very, very passionate about bats. They've given our officers um, every so often they come down, they give us training on the different type of bats and species and what's trending and what's happening and how they can help us. And, uh, you know, bats are not something that we truly like to interact with, just like any wildlife. We try to have as less contact as possible, but sometimes they get sick. Sometimes they enter into somebody's property. Um, sometimes they are injured and are poisoned or have something internal going on with them. Um, so that's when we do pick them up and get them tested. And then uh, if they are able to be re rehabilitated, we give them to the organization. And then these are questions, again, that were answered in the chat, but I'm going to just read them out loud for the group. Um, can animals be re relocated very far out where they can't return, uh, return? And unfortunately, there is no really very far out that will prevent wildlife from returning or from causing the same nuisance issues in another area. The sad reality is wildlife is also put at risk when trying to return to the area where they were relocated from. Um, but we do appreciate everyone trying to find a solution to protect wildlife, especially by being here today, by the way. So thank you to everyone. Um, two more, what causes like a coyote or puma to bite a child? And this is a recent incident. Um, unfortunately, a difficult question to answer though with an absolute certainty. The reality is that we don't always know why wildlife acts in a particular way. The most recent incident in Santa Clarita is currently under investigation with our law enforcement division and we're hoping to learn more soon. But we always recommend being aware and prepared in areas with mountain lion activity to prevent conflicts. And then um, last question. I've not seen bats. This uh, resident lives on Bradbourne and Huntington Drive. How can I get bats in the area to eat mosquitoes? And the answer is considering bats as a way to control mosquitoes, we would recommend visiting our Humane Wildlife Conflicts Toolkit to learn more about bats as well as how to encourage them to certain areas. There's actually a bat section and the website listed here is wildlife.ca.gov forward slash HWC. And that, that's it. So I wanna thank everyone again um, for our presenters for coming today. Oh, we have one more and then we are gonna close it up. So this is our last question. Are bobcats dangerous is the question. Well, you know, any, any wild, I'll go ahead and start off with it. So any, any wild animal is dangerous, right? You don't never wanna interact with something with teeth and claws, uh, but do they really attack human beings, bobcats? Not so much, uh, just due to their size. They really want to go after smaller prey and that sort of thing. They don't want to go after the larger animals, which 
humans are considered larger animals in their eyes. So uh, they really, they do pose a small threat, if you will, uh, but just not more than any other animal would. So same, very similar in size to a coyote and that sort of thing. I don't know if Rebecca or Mackenzie wants to add anything to that, but uh, that's my take on it. Yeah, I can just add a little bit here. I mean, basically what you're saying, bobcats are about the skitziest animal you're going to find out there. They really, yeah. really don't want to interact with people at all. I mean, I like having been a bobcat biologist, I have only ever run into two in the wild. And those are ones that I've almost run over with my car. So they really don't care to be around people. And when we're in the area, they're generally going to kind of peace out Girl Scout. Um, they really just don't care to interact with us. Um, I wouldn't try to go hug it, of course, but they really don't pose a significant threat to people. Yeah. And then another thing too, about mountain lions, I wanted to share my, uh, share my input on that is, is that with mountain lions, you know, they have a huge, uh, they have a great sense of eyesight and smell and hearing. Um, so with mountain lions, we do have them in our community. When you do see a mountain lion, um, usually just like Mackenzie kind of mentioned, she's very rarely seen a bobcat. Same is true with mountain lions. You don't really see them that often. If they see you or you see them, it's because they want you to see them. Um, I have seen a mountain lion. Um, and it's more for curiosity or just so that they know, um, or they're trying to present themselves that this is their territory. So just kind of keep that in mind that um, they know you're there well before you see them. Um, that's just how they are. Okay. Again, thank you to our panelists and everyone for attending. As a reminder, this video is actually gonna go onto the city's YouTube page. So if anyone wants to revisit some of the presentation, um, needs to point out some answers to their neighbor who was asking questions, please send them to the YouTube page, the city's YouTube page next week where this will be up. Uh, so it continues to be a great resource. And of course, uh, all the presenters today have left their contact information and seem willing and able to, to answer all of your questions offline if you think of anything in the meantime. Uh, other than that, thank you to everyone for coming out. And Karen Vance says we are in Doherty. We here in Doherty appreciate all of you and thank you. So I think it's the perfect line to end it on. Thank you so much, everyone. <laughs> Have thank a you. wonderful night.